For our final guest, I would like to switch to English because he's, he's, he's British, yeah? from London. Uh, he's considered uh, one of the world's leading futurists, innovation and strategy experts. He's the founder of the 311 Institute and helps corporations and governments to set the course for the future. He's author of the Codex of the Future series, and he appears regularly in global media, including BBC, Bloomberg, Discovery, all around the world. He is considered as the advisor behind the advisors. Very mysteri mysterious. And he's described as a young Kurzweil. His speech is titled The End of Choice. Give it up for Matthew Griffin. Thank you. The side that has no stairs. You can tell I'm an entrepreneur because I like making life difficult for myself. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for that introduction. So as I say, my name is Matthew Griffin. I look at the next 50 years. So I look at two kinds of futures. I look at the future, which I consider is the next 20 years. So I'll do that with organizations like Adidas, Samsung, RWE, if you've heard of any of those, because organizations typically care about the next 20 years, next one, two, three, five, 10, 20 years. I also work with governments like the Middle Eastern governments, like Singapore, South Korea, who care about the next 50 years because they want to try to dominate the next 50 years. So, in the true spirit of this particular presentation, which is called The End of Choice, I'm going to give you two choices. I've prepared a couple of presentations for you. You have the option to choose the presentation you would like me to present. So, hands up who would like me to present presentation A, the blue pill. Okay, so I guess I know where the rest of you are going. Hands up who would like me to present option B. Excellent, so that's about 50-50. Now, true to my word, I'm going with option C, the yellow pill. It's my choice, not yours. However, I've made the choice for you. You're now going to come along on the journey with me. So when we talk about the end of choice, it seems a little bit odd because we live in this world where we have more choice than ever before. How many different flavors of Tabasco would you like to put in your grocery basket? Here's a couple. It's probably another few thousand flavors that you could choose from. For those of you that like your Lamborghinis, what custom modifications would you like with your custom Lamborghini? What colors? What signatures? What performance? And all these kinds of things. Mercedes, I hear, also makes some decent cars, but hey-ho. Now, when we have a look at choice, choice is an act of choosing between one or more things. So choice is an act. My act was to choose for you. And this is the question. When we talk about the future of choice, who's making the choice? Or more specifically, what's making the choice for you? Now, if we step back far enough in time, the only way that we would make a choice would be using one thing, our brain. Now, I know the marketers among you can say, well, we have feelings involved in everything else. But typically, we used our own brains to choose. We would have an awareness event. We would decide that we would need something or want something. We would then go and have a conversation with our friends or more friends, round the bar. And depending how many drinks you had at the bar, 
you might end up with the wrong answer to your question. But this is how we used to do it. Step back 100 years ago, if I needed something, I'd go and have a conversation with my friends, my extended circle, and I'd come to a conclusion. And today, there's a lot more than choice that is being stripped away from us. So once I'd talked to my friends, I would go and explore. I'd go to the shops. I would experience things. I would pick up the clothes, test them, try them, and then I would choose the clothes or the product that I wanted to buy, and I would buy it. Come about the 1990s, the 2000s, all of a sudden, our brains were augmented with smartphones. So now when I had an awareness event, I decided that I needed something or wanted something, I would Google it. And by doing this, we actually removed experience from the equation. Because if I wanted that shirt now, I would explore all the different e-commerce websites, I'd explore Google, but I wouldn't actually experience those clothes. I wouldn't feel the fabric, I wouldn't go into a store and choose, I'd look at pictures on a screen. So technology has already removed the experience part of our choice. And then I would choose which shirt that I wanted from the e-commerce site that I wanted to buy it from, and I'd buy it. Now, as we surf online, all of our data is being captured. Offline, all of our data is being captured. Google right now, I know, thank you. That's a, that's a fan over there. That's it. We have dog treats as well. So don't worry, not left out, Fido. So Google is tracking me now. It knows that I'm in Nuremberg. It knows that I'm walking around. Using my smartwatch, it can tell that I'm thirsty. It can tell me that there's an Aldi around the corner and I can go and buy things. So increasingly, all of our data is being tracked online and offline in ways that you can't imagine. So for example, Facebook gathers more than 5,000 data points on each of you, whether you are on Facebook or not, let alone all the other platforms. So what we then do is we take all this big data, all these data points, and the big tech companies feed that to their algorithms and then their algorithms start becoming smarter. Their algorithms start making our choices for us. And they do it like this. Based on big data that we know about you, and based on people like you, because you're in a dem demographic group, we think you need to buy a handbag when you are walking around Nuremberg. Choose. So now, these algorithms are taking away our need, and to a degree, our ability to explore. They're also taking away our ability and need to experience products, because everything is online. Which handbag do you want, A or B? Now, when we start talking about the use of algorithms to proactively push products to you that you can allegedly make your own decision to buy. In the US, the Brookings Institution did a survey of 8,000 people, and they found that 52% of those people were happy letting artificial intelligence decide what they should buy. So to cl be clear, AI would say, here are your choices, Oh, by the way, I've bought something for you. Now, when we have a look at the evolution of artificial intelligence, we're moving from just that flat 2D screen to multi-channel, opti-channel, omni-channel, to voice. So, for example, at the moment, we have a conversation with Alexa. We say, Alexa, order us some toilet roll. And Alexa will run through some options. By the end of this year, and then rolling out next year, increasingly, Artificial intelligence, like Siri, like Google, 
like Amazon, Alexa, will be able to have a conversation with you. Because they can have a conversation with you, they can change your opinions and behaviors. So if I say, Alexa, I'm looking to buy a car, I'm thinking about buying a Mercedes, Alexa using its information, its access to lots of big data sources, could say, well, you're thinking about buying Mercedes, but have you thought about Audi? Because based on people like you, and your friends, and your social circles, all your friends drive Audis. And I know you like performance. And you had a bad experience with a Mercedes, and all these other things. So increasingly, artificial intelligence is shaping our opinions and behaviors. In which case, who's really choosing? Are you choosing yourself, or are you being prompted by an artificial intelligence to choose that thing or that thing that out of the thousands of things, the artificial intelligence has decided to show you. Now, when we have a look at AI, increasingly artificial intelligence is getting a face. It's also getting a body. So as we start talking about how we interface with technology, firstly, we can talk to technology to understand different things. However, increasingly, we can talk to digital humans with neural network artificial intelligence brains that can talk back, that can show you different products, share different experiences, whether those experiences are their own, my own, or experiences from thousands of other customers. And these things are increasingly authentic and sophisticated. And we also do digital dogs as well. That's it. Doesn't want to be left out. Hi. This is Neil. I'm Neil. Artificial human. It's a little bit different from an AI. I was computationally created based on how real humans look and behave. Every Neo has a unique personality, emotion, and intelligence. I'll help you find your style. I'll let you know what's happening around you. I'll guide your journey. I'll help you find your inner peace. I'll be someone you'll share your idea with. My dream is to help humans become even more human than ever before. So when we look at digital humans, digital humans are lifelike, authentic looking, digital replicas of actual people or fictional people that you can have a conversation with that increasingly respond to you using natural language that can then start selling you different things, showing you different options, and in some cases, choosing on your behalf. However, this presentation is called The End of Choice. So we've already seen many, many examples of this, robo-customers. Now, robo-customers are starting at the basic level, but if you think about your Samsung smart fridge, when you run out of milk, it knows you ran out of milk, it chooses the milk to buy, and then buys it, and then Just Eat or Deliveroo or Amazon or whoever it happens to be delivers that milk to you. Same thing with printers. Your HP printer runs out of ink, it automatically reorders. So when we think about robo-customers, customers that are buying products from you that aren't human, they're increasingly everywhere. For example, when we have a look at Amazon, like AWS, Microsoft Azure, the Internet of Things, increasingly, we have the sensors in our different devices. We have the sensors in your self-driving cars that are deciding by themselves where to buy their computer network power from. So when we talk about robo-customers, the use of artificial intelligence or robotic process automation to automatically order products on your behalf or for your benefit, they are much more wider spread than you might think. 
And then, of course, we have the algorithms. We all use Netflix. Who's really choosing when you use Netflix? Netflix is one. You turn the algorithm off. Netflix will show you what it thinks you want to watch. If the algorithm didn't exist, you'd probably, want, you'd probably watch something completely different. So the algorithm is saying, pick this or pick this. And in some cases, in some of the new features with Netflix, I don't know if you've seen it, you can go to the download section and it says, let us automatically choose for you. So next time you go into Netflix, it will automatically start playing what it thinks you want to watch without you making a choice. You're informed. When you go to Google, you type in information, you want to search for the latest news. Based on your previous experiences, your previous search history, Google will show you what it thinks you want to see, which leads to things like a polarized society. But it goes further. When we have a look at the algorithmic society, you're approved. I decided to buy that new Audi, and the artificial intelligence, using big data from banks and 450 data points from organizations like Santander and Lloyd's and Facebook and all these other areas, said, you are pre-approved for a loan for your new car purchase with this company. The AI chose who I take the loan out with. Now, I can always intervene and say, I think I want to choose myself. But increasingly, we are ceding control to the algorithms. When an algorithm says, I think this is the best loan for you, how many of you go, click, buy? You're hired. Over 65% of the Fortune 500 are using artificial intelligence to automatically and autonomously find new hires and new talent. The AI is choosing who you interview, and then ultimately who comes into your company. You're matched. If you use Tinder or Match.com or any of these kinds of platforms, that your future partners are being shown to you by an artificial in intelligence that says, out of the thousands of people on our platforms, pick one of these two to have a date with. And you pick one or two. Maybe you pick three, if you're a bit naughty. You're rooted. So for example, this morning, I went out for a sort of five kilometer run, basically around Nuremberg. And I put in some waypoints, but Google Maps chose my route for me. I didn't have to go, well, I think I want to go down Wurzestrasse, or I want to go along the river. It just chose my route. So when we have a look at the use of our augmented and artificial intelligence to make our decisions for us, it's much more widespread. Which then brings us to this. Bearing in mind the amount of data that's out there on all of you, your work habits, your professional habits, your personal habits, all that kind of stuff. We're already getting to the point where artificial intelligence, based on your medical conditions, your age, the, the area that you live in, your economic circumstances, knows what kind of couch you might like to buy. Then it buys it for you. So now, as we seed more of our choice to the algorithms, we can just rest on the perfect couch that artificial intelligence decided to buy for us. And ultimately, if we are not careful, as we cede more control to artificial intelligence and the algorithms, at what point do we all get lazy? And the AI says, I think you should pick a Volkswagen, not an Audi, and I just go, I'll have that. So we are all living in an increasingly algorithmic society. We are all ceding more choice to the machines than ever before. We are putting more trust in those machines than ever before. And that's it from me. So I hope you liked my choice. 
Your choices, by the way, I was actually lying. I hadn't put two other presentations together. So that would have been a much shorter presentation. So thank you very much.